when people awesome. come in. See a timer going up top. Perfect. Awesome. Thanks, Michelle. I think cool. I need a new laptop. Uh oh. <laughs> oh dear. No, no, that's okay. We're good. We're recording. Delightful. Cool. Thank you so much. And um, and so I would love to pass it over to uh, my colleague at UVM Extension, uh, Kimberly Hagen, who has been uh, sp spent a, a, a number of years now working um, with farmers who graze under solar arrays, helping them uh, to learn how to do that better from the grazing side, helping the solar array folks, both owners and operators um, and companies, learn how to work with farmers. So there's a lot of information there. Um, and Kimberly also just wrapped up um, uh, a project with the Gund Institute for Ecological Economics. Um, who's been working at looking at the financial side of this, the economic side of this. So anyway, uh, take it away, Kimberly. Thank you. All right. Hello, everyone. Um, we got a little bit of, I don't know where most of you are, but where I am, we finally got a little stretch of warmth here. Um, all right, I'm going to get my screen here. Um, well, There we go. Whoops, wrong one. Sorry about this, folks. <laughs> mm. Whoops. All right, I'm hoping everyone can see my screen. Did is it up there? Looks great. Okay, good. Sorry about that. I don't know what happened. Okay, um, just to say right at the beginning here, um, this is an area that's still uh, in the Northeast anyway, we are still in the infancy um, and still doing a lot of figuring this out. Um, it's been a couple of years of working on it, but it's um, it's a slow going process and um, compared to some other parts of the country. Um, and we are still what I would say in our infancy of this. Um, I'm calling it multi-purpose because um, the event that we held in the fall um, in September, um, it was a collaboration between the um, utilities. It was an effort to bring together um, utility companies as well as members of the grazing world and then also um, the pollinators um, community. They have been looking at these solar arrays as areas of refuge for um, pollinators um, with some of the plants that we can have in there and be protected. So all of us came to this event together to share some of the concerns and needs that each has and how we might find a path to collaboration. So it is a bit controversial um, to say the least. Um, and why? Because these are the main reasons that we hear. It's a blight on the landscape. It looks wrong on the agricultural landscape. It blocks the view shed and it takes our agricultural land out of use. This last one has been a particularly loud one, at least here in Vermont. Um, as we have, there was quite a burst of activity building these on some prime agricultural sites. Um, so people were um, upset about that. And there was a lot of uh, uh, loud uh, voices about it. But the opportunities are there um, for grazers um, and for pollinator community. This is the multiple uses of the same land and that can be a lot more efficient and profitable for everyone. Um, it provides additional grazing land for a sheep producer without actually having to own the land. It eliminates much of the need for fossil fuels for maintenance, and it provides shade for livestock in the open pastures as summers become increasingly hot. So we have some compromising areas um, that we have found. 
there's both the need and the demand for renewable energy sources, and that's not going away. Um, solar arrays are here and there's more coming. Uh, maintenance is required to keep these panels functioning well. And um, if we have vegetation growing up over them and blocking these panels, even just a little bit, it reduces their efficiency. Um, and we have found through trial and error in many places that sheep are really the ideal livestock for this. They're good grazers and they don't jump up on the panels. So goats don't need to apply for this job. And they're not heavy enough to disturb the panel footings when they rub. Um, cattle, you know, all these, all livestock tend to rub up against things and cattle are bigger and heavier. You know, they're anywhere from, you know, a thousand pounds to 1500 pounds. And that requires deeper footings for the panels. And then they also have to be raised higher up off the ground. So they are all around, it makes them more expensive. So sheep are pretty ideal and they reduce the need for fossil fuels for maintenance. Um, if they can graze down some of these grasses, um, it keeps that energy production equation green and more true to the renewable label that um, solar arrays grasp or use for their marketing. Probably one of the biggest pluses is that land is very expensive, especially in the Northeast. Um, and sheep farming is pretty marginal. So for anybody who wants to start up, you know, production, it's, it's pretty difficult. The return is just, um, it's pretty slim. So here's an opportunity to utilize, you know, land, you know, that you don't own and, you know, use it for grazing for your, uh, for your crop, so to speak. And you can get paid for that service. And that creates an income stream for the farm. is one of the sites in Vermont. So what we have found, what's really important is that the sheep producer and the utility personnel need to discuss their expectations um, of the partnership. And it's really ideal if they can do this before an array is even built, but we certainly, um, most of the ones in Vermont, in fact, have been done um, post building of the site. So it can be done, but Communication needs to be very, very clear. And here's some of the things that you need to consider. The siting, um, energy siting is a statewide jurisdiction um, with very limited local inputs. So there are five sizes of ground mounted solar in Vermont. And these are the ones we see and you can see that um, the smaller ones are where we're at right now. There's quite a few of those. The large ones, are we don't have so much here. Um, you do see those more out west and even just in New York State across the other side of the lake. Um, they've got quite a few that are, um, you know, the larger size than we do. Um, the two smaller categories um, can get um, additional on the adder <laughs> on the electricity payment rate with a letter from support from the region and town. So that can help too. Um, one of the tricky things, and this is actually up for discussion, I did see that it's um, on the list of bills in the Vermont legislature this season for, uh, you know, nothing will happen, but it, it's uh, being proposed and in discussion. But right now, use value appraisal for taxation, that's the program we use for getting your taxation reduced if you keep the land in production. So in 2016, um, there were 18,400 parcels and more than 2.4 million acres, and that's about a third of Vermont's total land. Solar makes the land ineligible, and the landowner must, if they put up a, um, if it's a farm and they put up a solar array, they have to withdraw that particular piece of land from current use and they have to pay that fine or that difference um, to go from it being in current use back to fair market value. And that can be a, a fairly steep price to pay. So if the landowner, if the farmer is taking more than half the power from that solar array, then they can keep it in current use. Um, 
and it's 10% of the fair, I guess it's fair mark, it's 10% of the fair market value. Sorry, I thought it was the full amount, but it's 10%. Um, my colleague who works with me on this quite a bit from the agency, um, Alex DePillis, he, he manages the, or researches the land use in the solar parts, and I work with him on the grazing parts, but I'm using his information today. Um, so on conserved land, um, a lot in the easement governs biggest land trust, um, 593,000 plus total acres and 720 plus protected farms. And that's 420,000 acres of forest land. Um, so general guidance, the solar size um, has to meet the farm's need on a farmstead complex. We've had three <laughs> um, successful uh, sheep grazing experiences so far in the state of Vermont. One, the first one, a uh, 17 acre, it's a high visibility site. And this one was pre-planned. Um, the solar developer bought a farm. It was in a um, highly uh, traveled, well-traveled uh, tourist corridor highway that goes through the state. And they decided that they, it has a lot of open uh, fields. It was ideal for a uh, solar array. So they decided that right from the beginning, they knew they wanted to maintain it with sheep because it had such a, um, it was, you know, had so much um, viewing by people traveling through Vermont um, and they were gonna be right out front. So they knew they wanted sheep. So they advertised for a shepherd right from the beginning. And the deal was that they set up was that the, um, the shepherd could live on site. They gave them the house and the barns and all the land um, to utilize, but they could own their own sheep. So they owned the flock, but they could use the uh, facilities. And they were there for, I think it was six or seven years and it went well. They, um, it worked really well for them. They found um, the original proposal had been for a 40 acre uh, array and after it went through some design reviews and the town and state um, reviews, it was reduced to a 17 acre and more, more condensed um, panel set. But it ended up working out really well. Um, it had a 12 foot high fence all the way around, perimeter fence, which was great, worked out really great for the um, shepherds. And then they um, divided it inside um, into smaller paddocks that they could use. And it gave them what they felt like was a really safe site so that that was the one time a year that they could leave for a small vacation, a short, you know, a week or two week vacation. And they could um, have a, um, you know, someone come and take care of the sheep for them. And once they showed them how to move them, they knew they were safe within that site. It also provided shade um, in the heat of the summer. So they found that that was really helpful as well. So it, it worked out good. Um, both sides were quite happy with it. Um, they've since moved on, they bought their own farm, um, I, but I think they their interest in grazing uh, solar sites is still there. And they, I think they hope to tap into that um, as an ongoing business for themselves. The other one is a one acre site um, grazed by sheep belonging to the landowner. Um, she bought this farm and the solar array was already on the farm. And uh, they had the previous owner, the farmer, had an arrangement where he maintained it for them, but he did it with mechanical means. So when she bought this farm, she asked the solar company how they felt about her managing it with her sheep. And at first they were very excited and they said, they were thinking, oh great, we won't have to pay for this anymore. And <laughs> So it was a bit of negotiating with them. Um, I was involved with it uh, to get them to understand that, you know, she's a professional. It's taking her time to manage the site and therefore she needs to be reimbursed um, for that time. It's a service she's providing. So um, they finally understood that and now she gets a payment um, every year, an annual payment for taking care of this site with her sheep. And then the last one, I'd like to bring it up. It was a, a homeowner that had a one acre site 
that served um, a few, a group of houses and he didn't want to mow it anymore. This was a residential area. He didn't want to mow it anymore. So he asked um, if, there, if there was anyone who was a shepherd that would be willing to come and maintain it um, and he would pay them. So the person that answered his request um, was not a very experienced shepherd and it didn't work well. There was not a perimeter fence and the sheep got out a number of times and got into people's gardens. And there was a lot of unhappiness all around and a lot of finger pointing and it did not end well. So um, that's why I, re I really learned from this that how important it is that everybody under has puts out what their expectations are and how this is gonna work and what they expect to ha happen. You know, are they expecting it to be mowed like a lawn mower you know, uniform, or can they live with maybe a slightly more raggedy appearance, but it's not blocking the panels. So you really need to get down to that nitty gritty level. And here's um, some happy sheep on a hot summer day. <laughs> so what we've done so far, we had two workshops in Vermont in spring of 2018. Um, with uh, Lexi Hain and Ashley Bridge of the ASGA, American Solar Grazing Association. They were um, an attempt to bring some utility owners, uh, solar site developers and the shepherds together. And we did have some great discussions at both events. Um, it was really, um, it worked really well to get some good discussion going. And then this last September, we had a, um, much bigger event. We had hoped to have it outside and visiting some of these um, solar arrays, but um, pandemic being what it's done for all of our lives, it ended up being a virtual event. However, it was great. Um, there were a lot of questions, a lot of discussion. And as I said before, this brought in the whole um, pollinator community as well. And um, there's a lot of work. We're still in our infancy with this. Um, Green Mountain Power, they have five sites, um, 40 to 50 acres, two former sand pits, and several sites are planned to be pollinator friendly. And currently they are paying 100 to $175 an acre for mowing, and they are not looking to pay for sheep. But they seem to lately be saying that they are willing to be a good neighbor and let farmers graze um, if they can get it figured out in a way that um, isn't too costly. So we'll see how that goes. Um, this is a private um, site that I've been working with for a few years. Uh, it's a 17 acre site with 23 surrounding acres. And we've been trying to find a shepherd to um, bring his or, or her sheep here to manage the site. Um, as you can see in the bottom picture, there's a lot of saplings starting to come up. So he's going to have to get onto this pretty soon. Um, we did get uh, a UVM, University of Vermont class, this past fall went out there and developed a plan on the best way to manage this site. Uh, I, I believe what they came down to was that, yes, it would make sense to use sheep. Um, but yes, so far we still do not have um, a shepherd to, that stepped up. Um, this is just some more data from Alex that the world's largest energy company, Next Era, has the largest site in an area cleared of the forest, quite difficult to mow. Um, the topography is, is also in, um, on top of that it was a cleared forest. And they are very interested in um, sheep, but they need to know more about it. So we're, we'll see if we can get them talking with a shepherd. I've got a couple uh, sent his way this just in the past month who are interested. Um, so we might have some developments there pretty soon. So what's on tap? Um, right now, Alex and I are working with some other collaborators on developing a checklist so that um, people have sort of a one page 
looking at the needs of the developer and what the needs of the shepherds are. Um, and I've been working hard trying to find a, um, develop this a la carte menu, a document that would help um, a shepherd to take a look at a site and be able to figure out what their costs were. It's tricky because every site is so unique and depending on where it is, um, how close it is to a road where they can bring in the animals and unload or load them up. Um, is there water there, the mileage? There's just so many things to consider and every site is gonna be different. So we've been trying to develop this um, a la carte menu that they could work from to develop the cost for a particular site. And these will serve both um, all communities, um, both the um, ASGA community and um, any other New England state as well. Um, I'm also working with a group on seed mixes. Um, right now, most of the solar arrays are renovated after post building um, with fast growing species of plants that are most often not very palatable for sheep and not very um, pollinator friendly either. So we're trying to find something that is not super expensive, but would you know, grow up to good grazing material. And also that pollinators um, would be, you know, happy with that, that they, and this is where some of the more um, trickier conversations we've had, pollinator groups have been looking at, you know, some of the flowering species um, and how do we work with that if sheep graze them and take away the flowers. But one of the more interesting things that came out at um, the grazing conference this past year in Vermont is um, a, one of the keynote speakers has a big research farm out in South Dakota. And one of the researchers out there found that bees, they were checking the pollen on bees and 70% of what they found on the um, uh, pollinators was from grass flowers. So that was, I found that to be really fascinating. So um, it, it'd be interesting if we get a, could get a uh, research project to look into that here in the Northeast, you know, how much of the, how much are bees relying on grass flowers versus, um, you know, wildflowers versus you know, cultivated flowers. And I think we could find happy meeting ground for grazers and pollinators to use the same space um, in solar arrays. We're also encouraging um, utilities and grazers to start using the uh, Vermont Land League and the New England Farm Land Finder. This is, um, works as kind of like a dating service. So if you have land that you want farmed or if you are a farmer and in need of land, it's where you can find each other. And if it has some of the criteria you're looking for, you can contact each other and then start having a conversation to see if um, you could have a partnership. Um, it's a free membership and you need that um, to um, get notification. If you aren't a member, you're not gonna get uh, notifications in your inbox that tell you when somebody has um, added their information. The key is gonna be using um, very specific language. So saying you have a solar field available for grazing sheep and you could say willing to have a conversation, or if you are a shepherd um, saying, I have uh, a flock of sheep, I would be willing to uh, take to solar fields for grazing and for maintenance. So those are gonna be important parts of it, but we really are trying to encourage people to use, start thinking about using this as a way to find each other. And a word about pollinators. Um, these are some pictures of them on flowers, although the bottom one you can see is raspberries, which um, are certainly grow and especially near wooded areas. Um, but I just wanted to say that again about, this is an interesting new development for me anyway, to find out that um, bees are relying so heavily on flowering uh, grasses. Uh, that's a really interesting new piece on this. So here are some resources, um, Vermont Land Link, the New England Farm Finder, the uh, report publication for the event we held last fall 
um, the guide to farming friendly solar arrays and it's free to download. Um, I would also highly recommend On Pasture. It's an online magazine and they've had some um, articles on this as well. And here is Alex. If you are a utility or interested in the um, use value appraisals or change taxes, any of that, he's an expert on that. All right, and we can look at some questions. I'm happy to see if I can get the... A uh, question about, do any of the shepherds employ livestock guardian animals for their flocks and have there been any issues with the owner accessing panels for maintenance or guardian animals interfering with panels um, or donkeys jumping on the panels. Um, you know, that was one of the discussions uh, people had at our event and I've, it comes up quite a bit. So far, I, I think that most people have felt like they did not want to have the added complication of guard dog animals when most these, all these places tend to have the um, 12 foot high perimeter fence, just because if there are maintenance people coming in to check on the solar array for any reason, um, you've, got to, you've got to have the shepherd there. Someone's got to be there because most often um, the guard dogs are not going to take very friendly to that. Um, most of them are pretty unfriendly towards strange people. So it's a complication that a lot of people have not been willing to um, deal with. Um, that said, I know that there are probably, I think I have heard of some in the, in the West where they do because they're so big and they do need those um, guard dogs. Um, second question, I noticed a little stem of what I believe was glossy buckthorn growing up alongside the mounting bracket of one of the early panel sides. If this got away from the sheep, who would be responsible for treatment? Um, yeah, good question. Um, more often than not, that's a that has to that's one of the things that has to be cleared up between the utility and the farmer. Who is going to if there's some finishing up, like you know, weed whacking that needs to get around difficult places, which they have to do if they use do mechanical. Most of the places that do um, big mechanical mowers have found that they still have to do the um, detailed weed whacking afterwards. Um, so that's a question that has to be figured out between the utility and the grazer. Who's going to deal with that, um, that part of it? Um, so, yeah, that is probably a unique situation per site. But for the most part, I think that most people have found that that's what the sheep have done, have been so great about is that unlike the um, places that are uh, done with mechanical mowing, the difference in the price where you have to have people spend more than a few hours doing after the mowing, they have to go back in with weed whackers and go around underneath the panels and around um, casings. Um, whereas with the sheep maintenance, you don't have to do so much. And the folks that we talked with out in Minnesota that the landscape companies, they are actually increasing the number of sheep um, operations that they are doing for maintenance rather than the mechanical because they found that that is the uh, where the difference is as far as economics is that when you have to bring in a um, labor force to do the weed whacking you've lost the that's the difference between grazing and not grazing um, it's cheaper to use the sheep um, Comment, sheep don't need to graze everywhere at once. Lots of blooms survive. And you're right. And I, I bring that up too, is that, you know, if you want to get have the flowers bloom, you could let it go through that phase. And then once they've, you know, gone through their flowering phase, then you can graze or you can uh, parcel it up and leave sections. Uh, 
Um, question, are there other suitable ag uses for solar fields? I've heard brassicas might work. Um, yes, in Massachusetts, um, they've developed a panel that is uh, clear, and so it lets the sunlight through, and they are growing crops underneath. Um, so yes, I, I don't know a whole lot about it. I've just heard about it happening. So um, yes, I, I think that that is another way to get a multi-use out of these areas. Um, what are the feelings from the solar companies of interior fencing for rotations in large solar fields? I have not heard that anybody has not liked it. Um, so far, it sounds like, you know, solar companies are fine with it. Um, what's been kind of some of, you know, we've heard that one thing they're really happy with is that with the shepherds bringing the sheep there and the shepherds tend to um, check on their sheep. Um, more frequently than, you know, oper solar operators would, there's actually someone on site more frequently and it's, um, they can give feedback that, you know, we, there's a panel that's um, cracked or, um, you know, twisted from a windstorm or a tree came down or anything like this. Um, they've actually been able to uh, give the feedback to the company and it's much appreciated. So I've heard some really good things about that, that they've really, um, it's been a positive feedback loop on that part of it. How has watering flocks been handled? Um, again, that's pretty individual and unique for each site. Um, and that's why one of the things that's really important, if you can get into a conversation pre the building of a solar site, so that if they are at all considering um, grazing, that maybe the water, a water system could be installed, you know, before it's even built, so there's water on site. A lot of places people do have to depend on um, trucking in water. Thing that's nice about sheep is that they don't drink very much, they get so much from the grass. And they found that um, if you have this, the solar arrays, if they can be in the shade for the hottest part of the day, it reduces their water intake considerably. Um, so even less water is needed. But yeah, it's unique for each situation. Um, and that is one that has to be figured out. Um, can this consortium help with advice regarding a large project here in Potter County? Um, I would say I would visit the ASGA site website, um, American Solar Grazing Association, ASGA. Um, you would find um, a lot of advice and help, and you might even get a shepherd um, connected with that organization. Has anyone used or looked into using a mix of sheep and dwarf goats, which are much smaller than regular goats? Um, I don't know of any. I know that um, the few projects that did use goats, it was not successful, but these are dwarf goats. So I don't know. That's a good question. Um, who is generally responsible for any damage done by the sheep? or other pastured livestock? That is another question that um, those who are deciding to collaborate have to discuss and decide on that between them. Um, again, you know, every situation is different and all the shepherds that I've spoken to, they've got, they've come up with different answers to that question. Um, is there uneven accumulation of manure under the shade? Is this a problem? Um, so far, I haven't heard that it is. I mean, certainly the sheep tend to lay down under there. And so what happens, what I've seen happen over time is that the forage doesn't grow under there, which is great. Um, and it provides them with the shade they need. But certainly as they stand up, that's when animals usually drop um, you know, their manure it probably would build up um, maybe after a few years, you know, and it would it would stay dry so it'd be easy to handle. You might want to go in there and maybe scoop some of that out and um, toss it into the other parts or else someone could package it and sell it. I don't know. <laughs> Good question. Um, 
comment, the first company I talked to about it said absolutely no interior fencing for the same reasons as they don't like uh, guardian dogs, but they seem to have gotten over that. Well, that's good to hear. That's really good to hear. Um, have you heard of any cattle grazing operations that have worked? We have one here in Vermont, actually. Um, I went when he first was starting. Uh, he put it out, it's just outside his uh, farmyard. And he really likes it because he uses it mainly in the springtime when his cows are calving. Um, he really likes them to be able to be outdoors because they stay healthier than when they're closed in. But the panels offer just enough cover. So if there's a heavy spring rain um, or, you know, just not, or sleet even, you know, not nice weather, the animals have just enough protection. Um, and he found it's really worked well for him. He's been really, really happy with it. But it's the only one I've heard of. Um, and as I said before, it is, it does make for a more expensive, expensive setup because you have to have deeper footings. All right, any other questions? No, it looks like that's it. Thank you, Kimberly, so much. Yeah. And um, so wanted, before everyone goes, I wanted to let you know that next week, we're gonna be doing a recap of the 2020 grazing series with the Maine Grass Farmers Association or network. Please join that. I'm going to send out this recording to everyone who registered and I'll put all of our links, all of our emails on it so you can get a hold of anyone you need to. Everyone, thank you and have a great day. All right. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Kimberly.